In 68, when Bobby announced on a Saturday morning from the Senate caucus room, I was watching with Laverle and our three young kids in Whittier, and I knew I wanted to be in the campaign. But I didn't know altogether how I would accomplish that. But I called Pierre Salinger, who I'd gotten to know. He was then vice president of Continental Airlines. And I said, I'd love to be able to do this. And he said, I'll, I'll find a way. And he did. Kept his word. And when I went into the campaign, I was known as a Salinger guy. There were Teddy guys and presidential, uh, President Kennedy guys. And I think eventually I was accepted as a Bobby Kennedy guy. They sent me to Nebraska. Uh, which was one of the key primary states. Uh, Bobby won big in Nebraska. And they were going to send me to Oregon. I said, why? Send me to San Diego, and they did. And that's uh, where, it, um, uh, where I was. Um, there are just <coughs> two stories, and then I'll turn it over to them because you didn't come to hear me. But with Bobby, everywhere we went, there, there were never less than two or 3,000 people, seriously. And in Detroit, there were hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, we did this rally um, in a parking lot of a sharp sh shopping center with a big flatbed truck. That was the platform, and that was where Bobby spoke. And uh, as he started to speak, <laughs> a guy was, was haranguing him. And um, so two Omaha police officers arrested the guy and started to take him to the patrol car. And Bobby somehow saw it. He said, uh, officers, please do not arrest that man. He has a right to be heard. But they arrested him, put him in the patrol car, started to drive away. And Bobby said, sir, I promise you, if I'm elected president of the United States, my first responsibility will be to free you from jail. <laughs> that was great. And then he ended every speech by quoting George Bernard Shaw. Some men see things as they are and ask why I dream dreams that never were and ask why not. And that was the key to the media, the press. Go to the bus because we're leaving. And towards the end of his speech, it started to rain, and it was raining really hard. And so <laughs> Bobby said, as George Bernard Shaw once said, run for the buses. <laughs> <laughs> so, he had the most amazing sense of humor and the relation and the ability to relate as no other person I've known in politics. In any event, enough of me, you came to hear Kathleen and, and Rick. And uh, in the family, I'm privileged, I think, to be known as a, a, f a friend of the families. And this is my best friend in the family. She is so incredibly uh, special. She's done so many great things in her life. She was Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. She should have been governor. But that's only a part of it. There are so many boards and commissions that she served on. Her life, like virtually any Kennedy person's life, is consumed by, by public and civic affairs. And she's just so great. Welcome, please, Kathleen Kennedy. Thank you, George. Oh, it's great to be with you, and it's uh, really terrific to be with George Mitrovich, um, who I met many, many years ago, and he had me come and speak, I think, in 1987. I brought one of my daughters. And then later, um, in, 19, uh, in 2003, I came back to San Diego with another daughter, and as I came under the bridge, I thought, George Mitrovich. And George found my daughter an apartment, a bed. He's still wondering where the bed is. <laughs> he found her uh, a dress, dress of drawers. He got her a job. And uh, she married a guy from San Diego. So she got him a husband, and they produced three grandchildren for me. So thank you, George. <laughs> well done, George Mitrovich. 
He's, he's a miracle worker. <laughs> And he's a great friend. Um, we, we went together when the um, baseball league said they were going to do something special for African-American baseball players. Um, and George knows baseball. <laughs> and I don't. Um, so I called him up and said, would you join me in, in Memphis? And he came, and we spent about three days together. Um, and he introduced me to everybody, and I got everybody's autograph, which pleased my son-in-laws and my husband because I, of course, didn't know what was going on. <laughs> but George is great, and he is uh, enormous energy and, vivas and, and love of country and patriotism and understanding of the role of faith in public life. So I am just thrilled to be here with him and with each of you who are obviously here because you're his friend. I'm also delighted that I'm getting to be here with Rick Allen, who um, has been a friend of mine for, you know, I guess another 30 years when he worked, uh, campaigned and, and uh, worked in the Clinton administration, helped to set up AmeriCorps and wrote uh, speeches for President Clinton. And throughout his life, he's had a, a sense of, of service and commitment. And also, he's really good at technology and media and he knows how to get things done. So one of the things key in life is getting things done. And what he's done, which I am so grateful for, in this time that people are remembering Robert Kennedy 50 years after he died, um, he put together this wonderful book of my father's speeches so that you can get, you know, there's one thing to read about somebody, but there's another thing to get directly what that person said. So I wanna thank Rick for doing this, and I would love him to come up and talk about his book, and I know he signed a few copies. If you could buy his book, that would also be really wonderful. Thank you. This is the book for those of you who didn't see it on the way in. It's great to be here at the George Mitrovich family reunion. Uh, <laughs> we're very pleased to be included in the family. And I think I can announce that the Hickenlooper Kennedy Townsend ticket is appointing George as ambassador to Alaska and the free state of California. So you'll, you'll see him soon in, in, in tales. Um, what I'd, I'd like to do is turn this into a duet as rapidly as possible. But I wanted to tell you what you can expect from this book since, as Kathleen said, you'll all buy it. Um, there are three parts to it, which is a little bit unusual in terms of its construction. But it centers around the principal public remarks of Robert Kennedy during the course of his lifetime. And it's the only collection of his words that one can find. Even in the era of Google, it's extremely difficult to find the actual speeches. And, Without having those public remarks, it's difficult to understand why on Wednesday we'll have 5,000 people from around the world in the hot sun of a DC summer at this memorial at Arlington. So that was the reason for the book. The other two parts are the narrative weave of his life and times to put those excerpts in context. And the front part of the book, which is a collection of 30 brief essays, half page to a page, from notable world leaders, four presidents, five Nobel Peace Prize winners, the winner of 22 Grammys, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, a variety of others. And so I think the combination gives you a sense for Robert Kennedy. Uh, this is a very young audience, but it will surprise you to know that more than half of Americans today were born after Robert Kennedy was killed. And that means they have no personal experience with the man. They never heard him speak. They didn't watch him on television. And he served for only three and a half years as an elected official in the Senate. His presidential campaign lasted 82 days. And yet we're talking about him 50 years later. And on a beautiful San Diego Saturday morning, all of you came out. Now, admittedly, the Mitrovich family had to come out. but, <laughs> but you, you came out to talk about this man. And I think one way of understanding why we're all doing this is to think about his relevance and importance to us today. 
because this book, Kathleen's lifetime career and service, and her siblings, all of this really is a recognition of what Robert Kennedy has meant to us since and what we can take of his lessons and apply them to our own life and to our own times. So I, I've found it fun to throw ideas out there. I'll give you a quote or two and ask Kathleen to tell the stories that demonstrate really how Robert Kennedy's character was noticeably different from the politics that we face today. And so the, the first kind of message that I think Robert Kennedy has for us today is to toughen up. We talked about this a little bit over dinner last night, that toughness is now being shown by blustering and being a bully. That was the antithesis of Robert Kennedy's toughness. He came to public attention uh, with his work on the Senate Rackets Committee as a staff member going after really dangerous people in a dangerous world, going after Mafia Don's corrupt labor union officials. Uh, and he also used that toughness in a remarkable way to help us find a way out of the most serious crisis in terms of the threat of nuclear war that the country's ever faced, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and a quote from his book written about the Rackets Committee years called The Enemy Within is, it seems to me imperative that we reinstill in ourselves the toughness and idealism that guided the nation in the past. And it's that combination of toughness, toughness and idealism. Kathleen has told me great stories about the Rackets Committee years and the impact on the family of her father's toughness understanding the kinds of people he was dealing with, which I'd like you to tell us, but also if you would reflect on the Cuban Missile Crisis and what the central lesson was, because I think it's so remarkably important for today. Thank you, Rick, thank you. Um, well, I would like to talk a little bit about first the uh, racket committee hearings. Um, you know, my mother and father believe very much that we should be know what was going on, and so, you know, when most three and four year olds were taken by their mother to the playground to swing on the swings, to play in the sandbox, or to, uh, you know, go on the seesaw, my mother took me to the Senate Racket Committee hearings. <laughs> <laughs> day after day after day. And um, they did last quite a while. And uh, some of my, you know, I'm three years old, even younger than you two over there. And I, my first words were almost, I refuse to answer that question <laughs> on the grounds that may tend to incriminate me. Because as you remember, Dave Beck and Jimmy Hoffa took the fifth time and time and time again. So I learned early on that there was evil in the world um, and that you had to had to fight it. So I figured my father would always have a job because there were always gonna be bad guys. So, and, and, there were, and, and it was really was a tough thing to do. Um, he had, his own father had said, don't, don't do it. Um, he thought that was not a smart thing if you're gonna run for president to take on the mob. Um, uh, but he did, and they were angry at him for doing that. So that, for instance, when I went to Our Lady of Victory uh, parochial school where we had you know, 45 kids in our class, those were the times before they thought you should reduce class size, but you know, we had one nun who just basically said, you've got a choice, heaven or hell. <laughs> and that kept us quiet. <laughs> but anyway, but at that time, um, uh, at one, there was a six month period where the Teamsters um, had threatened to throw acid in my eyes and the eyes of my brothers who went to Our Lady of Victory. So we weren't, unlike the other children, allowed to leave our Lady of Victory, and we had to go up to the principal's office and wait till my mother arrived to pick us up, and we weren't allowed to leave where we lived in Virginia called Hickory Hill, um, and had to stay within the confines, and there were some police uh, on the, the perimeter to protect us. And that was an effort on the part of the mob to intimidate my father to say he would go after us, the children, but my father was not intimidated, and he um, didn't believe that 
they would really carry out that threat. So I hope that's what he was doing. <laughs> 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 but he did that because he said, um, in, he said this when he was doing that kind of work, that either uh, the mob, uh, organized crime was going to control our country, or we will. And he really was afraid of what organized crime could do. And in fact, you may not know this, um, some people do, but uh, during this period, J. Edgar Hoover, who was then head of the FBI, didn't want to acknowledge that there was such a thing as organized crime. Uh, he said it was made up. And it wasn't until my father um, got a few of the mobsters to go with the tape and talk about what they were doing and actually introduce legislation, the RICO Act, on organized crime that finally J. Edgar Hoover said he would admit that they existed. He thought it was much easier to be the hero where you just go after um, you know, drug dealers, perhaps, or you know, fake communists than actually go after the real criminals in our country. And my father was willing to take that on, and, it, and I think that laid a, a groundwork for some people to say he was ruthless, I didn't find him that way. <laughs> but um, it, he was ruthless, I think, in the sense that, you know, if he sees something wrong, you have to go after it. You can't just stay on the sidelines. Uh, he often quoted Dante, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of moral crisis preserve their neutrality. And he wasn't going to be neutral in the face of these mo the mob. And I think that's, we have those same issues today. I'm not going to get into that right now, but I will go on to the next issue, which is um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because, as you may remember that, um, the Russians had put um, nuclear warheads in Cuba, or were trying to wreck them, and the question is what to do. And my father was part of the XCOM uh, committee that John Kennedy had put together to, to ask what they should do. And I did, what was smart about President Kennedy, he would often say, you discuss it without me in the room, because he realized that people always want to suck up to the president and not want to really discuss the things frankly and freely. So he thought he'd get out of the room and people could discuss it. And what my father discovered is that the uh, first reaction of the military was to bomb. They, wa they just wanted to bomb the heck out of Cuba. And he said, well, after that, what's going to happen? Well, the Russians won't do everything, anything, so said the generals. And you could understand why um, they hadn't thought through the next step or the next step or the next step. They were just wanting to bomb right away. And my father, luckily, and I remember this as a young child, had read, as had John Kennedy, Barbara Tuckman's uh, the guns of August, which showed that you did, people just fell into World War I, not thinking about what the next step would be. So number one, they looked at, he was willing to ask those questions. And the second thing he really understood um, is how important it was to treat your enemies, Khrushchev, with respect, and understand that he too, just like John Kennedy had the generals who wanted to go to war, Khrushchev too had generals who wanted to go to war. And so that he was pushed in both directions. And as we may have, many of you may remember, there were two letters, one which was conciliatory and then another followed by a very tough letter. And they brilliantly decided to answer the first letter and not the second letter because they understood where the enemy, quote, was coming from. And they also understood that he needed to have a sense of pride and a sense of nobility when he withdrew those um, ICBMs or um, the, the missiles. And I think that's really, you know, my Daddy then wrote a book called uh, Just Friends and Brave Enemies because he had to understand that you always had to treat those with whom you disagree with respect. And that's, I think, an important lesson for today. And always, whether it's in public life or private life, always understand that's a human being on the other side and understand where they came from so that they have a bit of dignity in no matter what you do. I think there was another aspect in addition that, that Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy exercised that we'd be uh, well advised to keep in mind in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it came out of exactly that sense that, that you enunciated. And, and that is that it's not important for you to claim credit at the end of a successful negotiation, particularly with the superpower. 
And the president, uh, according to your, your dad in, in the book 13 Days, which was completed after his death, but where he had written the manuscript, he said that the president had instructed everyone on the staff, no announcements, no crowing, uh, let it speak for itself and give the Russians the opportunity to make this kind of a joint determination. Um, and I think we'd be well off to remember that. You also touch on the activism which George mentioned in his introduction has been so much a part of the Kennedy family history. And it makes sense to have activism among folks running for public office and in uh, the public sphere. I think it's much harder to instill that in most people who have their own issues, their own family concerns, their own business needs to lead a purely civilian life. Robert Kennedy said that in a democracy, the highest title is that of citizen. And that notion is something which I think would be a lesson for us in these times and a reminder of how we can engage. And there are two quotes, one from the University of Mississippi Law School, and I'm gonna ask Kathleen to tell us the background on that. But the quote is, each of us will ultimately be judged and will ultimately judge himself on the extent to which he personally contributed to the life of this nation and to world society of the kind we are trying to build. It was that sense of personal contribution. And um, the, the circumstances that brought Robert Kennedy down to Mississippi years, just a few years after tremendous disturbances, loss of life, um, and under circumstances where he was, as happened so often in his life, counseled not to go down there. Too hot, too hostile, they don't like you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what followed? Yeah. Thank you. So um, that's, that quote was from 1966, and as many of you remember, a few years before, my father had helped James Meredith Go, uh, be admitted to the University of Mississippi under very tough circumstances. They had to federalize the uh, National Guard. And p as, as um, Rick said, a number of people were, were killed. Um, it was an awful, awful situation. But um, when my father was asked to, by the law school, the dean of the law school and the students there to come down, he was wondering whether he should go down. It was A, dangerous, and B, he didn't think he would be treated <laughs> very well. But he thought, he should say yes, because it's very, he believed very much that you should talk to people even if they disagree with him. So he said yes, and then the Board of Regents got wind of the fact that my father was coming to the University of Mississippi, and they were horrified. And they told the, de the dean of the law school to, to withdraw the invitation. And the dean said, I will resign if you force me to withdraw the invitation and my top faculty will also wrote a letter and said we will resign if we can not have Robert Kennedy come and speak that's not free speech so at that point the question of what they should do with then the US senator from uh, New York went to the Board of Regents and they took a vote as to whether they should allow Robert Kennedy to come and speak there and the vote was five to four so he was allowed to speak but not with a lot of love. <laughs> and so he went down, he went and he was with my mother and they described it was in a very bumpy plane. My mother hates bumpy planes. Um, and the, the um, I think it was the basketball arena was filled, 17,000 people showed up. People were hanging out of the trees on the way in. So we just couldn't believe that that many people would be interested in him and what he had to say. And he, he walked on stage and holding my mother's hand very tightly. And people were impressed that he liked my mother. <laughs> you know, that he had a wife, you know, he wasn't the devil incarnate. <laughs> and uh, J uh, Hiram Eastland, who, was Senator Eastland, who is Senator Eastland's nephew and was a friend of mine, uh, said that my father was wearing a pinstripe suit and that 
people had never seen that before, and that afterwards, the next day, there was a rush on pinstripe suits. <laughs> but what was really extraordinary is that uh, he gave his talk, he said those words, and then there was a question and answer period. And he described what decisions he made about James Meredith entering the University of Mississippi and how Ross Burnett was so extraordinarily ridiculous, wanting to, pr proposing, for instance, that um, the military, uh, the, the federal marshals come up and point a gun at him and he only withdraw because the gun was pointed to him. In other words, he wanted to set up a whole kabuki theater about what was to happen. And you can hear from the tape, if you ever watch it, the students just roaring in laughter at Ross Barnett. And by the end of that s speech, he got a resounding 17,000 students giving him a standing ovation. And it really shows that, you know, if you are willing to talk to people with whom you dis who don't who did think you as the devil, but if you're willing to try and willing to go out and willing to tell your story, it can rebound to your benefit. I don't know if they would have voted for him, but they at least really respected him. And I think that's a great lesson for what each of us can do in our own lives. You know, talk to people with whom we d disagree, and. Uh, and things can happen that you don't ever imagine. I, I, th I think that's really critical, R particularly in the presidential campaign. Your father was the candidate for reconciling an America that was every bit as polarized as we are today. And part of what he used to accomplish that reconciliation was to talk to people who he knew would be hostile to him or his views or to confront people who were very comfortable in their lives and were ignoring the context of other Americans' lives. And that uh, sense of being not only open for dialogue, but realizing the importance of fact-based statements and true debate to try to discern truth came from his sense of patriotism and his uh, belief in how you create good policy. He gave many speeches on college campuses and he, these were often very confrontive dialogues. But two uh, stand out to me. One was at Berkeley up north in 66. He said, wisdom can only emerge from the clash of contending views the passionate expression of deep and hostile beliefs. At Queens College the year before, he had said, there can be no meaningful politics which is ignorant of the facts. That's <laughs> an interesting quote to apply today. But I think you have to ask yourself, are we going to end up reconciled as a country and better off in terms of making true advances on our intractable problems if we only give red meat speeches to carefully selected audiences of admirers, or if we do as Robert Kennedy did and mix it up intellectually with the kind of respect that George mentioned in Nebraska where you are willing to let the hecklers come up and engage in debate. One of the stories in the book, and there are a lot of stories about this particular characteristic of Robert Kennedy is from Roseburg, Oregon, which has been important in uh, national media coverage twice in our lifetime. The first was for the event that's uh, described uh, in the book. It's, Roseburg is the, in the southwest corner of Oregon. It's uh, a largely rural community. Hunting and fishing are really important. Gun rights uh, are therefore important. And the NRA did one of its first mass radio campaigns in Roseburg in advance of the Oregon primary in May of 1968, going after Robert Kennedy for being co-sponsor with Senator Tom Dodd of legislation that wanted to take rifles away from the mentally ill uh, and, and others who were dangerous to themselves and others. Courthouse, outdoor speech, 
a number of thousands of participants, as George said, all of those rallies were supporters and NRA members, a lot of signs about uh, gun rights and you're not gonna take our guns away. And Kennedy said, we need to talk about what this legislation is and what it isn't. Because none of us are trying to take away guns. And so he said, what I'd like is for someone in the audience with one of those signs or that belief to come up and let's talk about this. And so a burly guy came from the back, introduced himself, explained his concerns, and Kennedy went through precisely what the legislation was trying to accomplish. Again, with a, with a really deep sense of respect that his opponent had the right in a rally convened by a candidate asking for votes. What a remarkable idea. That the opponent had the right to be involved in that dialogue. Um, and and I, I think it's just really a, a critical element of what he would tell us today. Um, but the other part of that is empathy. And that, again, um, to me, was such a signature part of who he was and what his appeal was and what his children have demonstrated throughout their lives and careers. Um, and I'd, I'd like to ask you about his trip to the Delta and also the influence on you with regard to Native American rights and life on the reservation. But I happen to love this quote, so anytime I'm given a microphone, <laughs> I, I gotta give it. It's from a Citizens Union speech in December of 1967. And Kennedy talking about what it meant to be an American. He said, it is not easy to know what that means. But in part, to be an American means to have been an outcast and a stranger, to have come to the exile's country, and to know that he who denies the outcast and stranger still amongst us, he too denies America. Again, a very different kind of statement than we may hear today, but it was based on his sense of being a third generation immigrant, that we all came from somewhere else and we all bore responsibility to those who followed. The Mississippi Delta, probably the poorest place in America, with the possible exception of Indian reservations. If you could talk about those trips and the influence on him and on you and the family. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Well, he was, just, I just want to underscore his real sense of understanding what it is to be an outcast, even though obviously his father did very well in this, this country, um, significantly well, and we're still benefiting from that. But he had to leave Boston because there was the prejudice against the Irish, and my grandmother, Rose Kennedy, would often talk to me when I was growing up about how there were the signs, help wanted, no Irish need apply. So there was, when, he, when President Kennedy was elected president, and my father, uh, with him as attorney general, there was a real sense in the family of standing in both camps. One, understanding the prejudice against Irish, against Catholics at all. You know, there was such prejudice during that 1960 campaign when Billy Graham and Norman Vincent Peale wrote a letter that says, don't vote for John Kennedy because the Papist will take over the White House and there will be rosary beads around the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> That may be forgotten, but those two people, you know, who are seen as great Americans were completely prejudiced against Catholics um, at that time. So because of that empathy that comes from being an outsider, he understood, I think, what other outsiders um, might feel like. And I, I, he went down in 1966 to the Delta in Mississippi because he had been asked to, to do some hearings on um, poverty. And when he came back, I remember him coming back to our room, it was to our dining room in June, and it was this, you know, I, as you can imagine, our dining room was very nice, about half the size of this room, crystal chandelier, linen tablecloths, uh, china on the table, we, it was all set for Sunday dinner. And he, I, he walked in the room and I was there and he said, he looked ashen and shaken. He said, Kathleen, I've just been to Mississippi and I met a family, a whole family lives in a, a hut 
smaller than our dining room. And the children have distended stomachs because they don't have enough food. And there's sores all over them because they don't have access to doctors. Do you know how lucky you are? Do you know really how lucky you are? You have a responsibility to do something for our country. And so he was, he, he said that to me, which is he said that to me on a number of occasions, which I can get into, but what was also true is when he saw that kind of poverty, he didn't just you know, say this is terrible. He actually got Orville Freeman, who at that time was the Secretary of Agriculture, to say you've got to change the rules on food stamps because at that time, up until that time, you could only get food stamps if you paid cash. And he said, you know, there's some Americans who have no cash. And Orville Freeman didn't believe it. And he said, no, go down and see, see the Delta. And they changed the rules on the food stamp program because people who live in certain communities never can imagine that other people in other communities don't have the same poverty. He also spoke, as, you, as Rick said, very eloquently about um, and fe felt a special kinship with Native Americans whenever we would travel. I mean, obviously, I just to underscore, my family, my mother and father, really wanted me to know what was going on. Obviously, anybody who takes their three and four year olds to the Senate Racket <laughs> Committee hearings <laughs> is not gonna be a laggard. I mean, <laughs> just to give you that, my mother thought it was so important that everybody knew what was going on that when she ran the carpool, she'd quiz everybody in the carpool as to what was going on. You could see them, oh no, Mrs. Kennedy is driving today. <laughs> I mean, when I took my kids on the carpool, I wasn't allowed to speak to my to anybody. She, she's quizzing everybody about current events. It was really stimulating, <laughs> to coin a phrase. Anyway, so when we, when we would travel, whether we'd go to New York, um, we would drive through Harlem if we went to, um, uh, on, like when we went down the Colorado River, my, my father would take us to the uh, nearby Indian reservation because he wanted to see how people lived. And he came to my high school in 1968, um, in February of that year, and gave a speech. And, and when he spoke, he talked about how the unemployment rate on Indian reservations was the highest in the country, and the suicide rate among high school students was astronomical and how unfair that was and how unjust it was and how we needed to do something about it. And a friend of mine, my classmate, said, Kathleen, let's work on the Indian Reservation uh, this summer. So we, d so, um, and I tell you that because, just because I was Robert Kennedy's child, you'd think I'd figure that out for myself, but I didn't. And it was really a friend of mine who said, let's go and work on the Indi Indian Reservation. And I'd like to say that because I think it's important to choose your friends wisely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And we did, and so that was the summer that my father in June was, was killed, and um, so we thought what would be the best way to remember him, and my friend and I went and worked for that summer on the Navajo Indian Reservation in Arizona, and I thought it was a great way to remember my father, and because he cared so much about what happened to Native Americans. I think I'm gonna touch on one more subject uh, and, and then we'll take some questions and thoughts from the audience. And, and it dovetails well, I think, with that last point. Robert Kennedy understood that revolutions were largely the work of the young. Uh, but he defined youth and the need for youth differently than chronological age. He said uh, that youth is not a time of life but a state of mind a temper of the will, a quality of the imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure over the life of ease. That kind of activism we are seeing all over this country in people who are young, again, in their state of mind, uh, including the, the students at Marjorie Stoneman High School in, in Florida, who I had the opportunity to spend time with in New York a uh, week before last. And that is the central Kennedy concept of a ripple of hope. Each of us may be small pebbles dropped into a pond, and the ripples are not very large individually. But taken together, those ripples really do build a mighty current. And that's the spirit that I think has to come back to America for us to reclaim the country. And, and so, Kathleen, I'm gonna ask you to conclude in whatever way you would like to, and then we'll take some questions. 
Thank you so much. Well, he did, uh, you know, he gave that speech about ripples of hope in South Africa. And I think he, he used that term um, because he, and he didn't ask for political engagement at that time because he knew that in 1966 political engagement in South Africa would be tantamount to jail or suicide because you were going to be beaten by the South African government or police and it would be terrible. So he wanted to say that there are lots of ways to make a difference in a police state. But in the United States, he did want people to get politically involved. Um, he often quoted, um, uh, you know, he loved, I'm gonna do the Hannah Arendt. Uh, you know, he loved Hannah Arendt who wrote a book called On Revolution and described what Thomas Jefferson must have meant by the pursuit of happiness. Um, you know, remember he wrote, everybody has a right, he really said all men, but I can't quote everything Jefferson says. <laughs> has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And just think for a moment, I'm not gonna quiz you, but just close your eyes and think, what do you think he meant by pursuit of happiness? You can close your eyes too, George. <laughs> he knows the answer. So, okay, open, just think of what you were thinking about. Well, what Thomas Jefferson meant by pursuit of happiness is the ability to get involved in politics. Because if you think about that revolution, it was not no taxation, it was no taxation without representation. It was really about the ability to get involved and get engaged and have a role and have a voice. They all had private, you know, the leaders of that revolution, Mount Vernon, very nice, Monticello, pretty good. John Adams had a lovely place in Quincy. But what they didn't have is the ability to control their destiny. And that's what the revolution was about. And that's what happiness is, that you can have a voice and control your own destiny. And my father would talk about that. And he often quoted that the Greek word for idiot, idios, is, so it comes back um, to 2,000 years ago, is a private person, somebody not engaged in public life. I think you're learning a few things from this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think my uh, last thought is really that politics can be honorable. I think we've been told for on and on how it's ugly and people who go in politics are just self-interested and how terrible they are. And how some, I was with somebody the other day who said anybody who does politics has some personality disorder. Well, they may. <laughs> <laughs> I may, but who doesn't? <laughs> I mean, we've all got challenges. So get involved in, in vote, campaign, organize because otherwise it, the country's gonna be taken over by people who you don't believe in, and it is up to us as Democrats, small d, big d, get involved, get engaged, participate. Thank you. Can we, do, can we take a few? We'll take a few questions. I'll come out with the microphone and, and offer you a vowel or a consonant. Um, Anybody have comments, questions, thoughts? Want to sing their school fight song? Kathleen, I wonder how you coped during all of these crises in your life and the crises that your whole family had. And um, they were just unlike any other family that I've ever heard of. I don't know how you, you all survived through it. Well, um, I, will t I will tell you um, that when my uncle died, President Kennedy died, my father um, wrote me a letter from the White House two days after he died. And he said, um, now you have to remember this context. This is two days after the president died. There was a funeral service. Thousands of people were coming from all over the world to, to uh, Washington. He didn't know what his own life future would be or hold because, you know, obviously he didn't have a good relationship with Lyndon Johnson. And he was worried about Jackie, um, who had to move out of the White House and what was she gonna do? So there were a lot of things on his mind. And he had the presence to sit down at the White House and say, dear Kathleen, you seem to understand that Jack died and was buried today. As the oldest of the Kennedy grandchildren, you have a special responsibility 
be kind to others, work for your country, love daddy. And if you think about how some people react to tragedy or somebody being killed, they might be, A, not write you a nice letter, <laughs> B, might be filled with a sense of bitterness or anger or revenge and just says, I want to get back at the world. And he didn't do any of those things. He talked about responsibility and kindness and working for your country and love. And so that is part of how he helped us. And I think it's really um, part of really what my family believed in. Uh, in one hand, my grandfather, when his son died, was very, up Joe Kennedy, very upset. But he, he said, you can't just feel sorry for yourself. That's not what you're allowed to do. And my grandmother believed in very, had a great, great deep faith, which you know my mother also had, and took us not only to Mass every Sunday, but during the summer to daily Mass. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> when other kids were getting to sleep in the morning, we were up at 7 o'clock going to daily Mass all summer long. Um, and saying the rosary every night and reading the Bible every night. Actually, when I told my mother, my grandmother that we read the Bible, she said, really? Catholics don't read the Bible. <laughs> I was kind of horrified that we would read the Bible. <laughs> I know that's more than you asked. <laughs> anyway, it all helped. <laughs> Questions, anybody? Thank you. Kathleen, did your father write all of these speeches himself? No. No. No, he, um, no, he, no, no, no. He didn't. He had, um, he, he would talk to his speech writers. Um, he had a terrific speech writer in Adam Walensky, um, very smart, very brilliant guy. Um, and P uh, Jeff Greenfield, who you might see once in a while on CNN, and Peter Edelman. Um, now, they weren't hired as speech writers. They were hired, um, and Rick can talk about this, they were really hired as policy people, but they had a gift for language. And Dick Goodwin also helped. But Daddy, but I'm going to, and Adam would, told me this. He said, you know, Kathleen, why did I write the best speeches for your father? Because he was, because he knew what he wanted to say, and he had a particular viewpoint, and I just put words, I fame those words. He also wrote speeches for a number of other people, including um, Mario Cuomo, but, and Mario Cuomo has great speeches, but they aren't as good as my father's. And so it's not just the speechwriter who does it. They help, but it's really the passion and what the, the, the person wants to get across. So it's always good to remember you can have the same speechwriter for f seven different candidates, and in one candidate or one politician, they'll do great work, and the others, it will sound so pedantic, you can't stand it. And it's a pedantic candidate's fault. <laughs> I, I mentioned a couple of other factors to following on uh, to what Kathleen said. And, and actually, this is covered in the book. We, we've got a, a, a brief uh, chapter talking about the process. First, Robert Kennedy was a terrific writer. He started out as a writer. The first part of the book, he's at he's 22 years old. He's in the British Mandate of Palestine uh, a month before the State of Israel is declared, writing byline pieces for uh, the Boston Post on the situation in the Middle East, the responsibility of America within the region, and the likely future for that troubled part of the world. 22 years old. Um, and I, so I think that love of language, which was for him innate, he was not a natural speaker. He was a practice speaker who got better over time. Love of language first. Second, the process that Kathleen referred to of working with his speechwriters. He would start the process by saying, okay, we're going to go to San Diego and here are the topics I want to cover. Here are other speeches that we've done that hit these points and I'd like you to pull that through. But I really want to take the education part of it in a different direction. So please talk to these three experts who I've been talking to over the last month and really dive into what they think about this. And then they'd work the drafts over and over again. 
in the course of the campaign, it's flying way too fast. And that's why you get similar language coming back up again, just because the machine has to be fed. Uh, but it was that very precise relationship. And I've been to the John Kennedy uh, Presidential Library and, and held the podium copies of many of these speeches. And you can see where the night ran long. And there were a lot of sp speakers ahead of him. And he could tell the audience wanted to go home. And he's got a, a, a pen, and he's just striking page after page and rewriting on the fly, sitting up on the dais. And so I, I think that makes these richer, more memorable, and also why we can say it's his words for our times, which is the title of the book. Kathleen, how is your mother? Is she the last of that generation? Oh, um, thank you. She, she ju we just celebrated her 90th birthday in April, um, and Vice President Biden came, Nancy Pelosi came, and uh, Steny Hoyer, and she just had a blast. <laughs> um, so, and she's, you know, she's, unfortunately she can't walk as well as she used to. She's, um, I think all those skiing accidents finally took their toll. Um, but she has a, a great time. She's not the last of the generation. I, I have an, her college roommate was Jean Kennedy Smith, my mother, my father's sister, and it's through Jean that my mother met my father, so the two of them are still alive. Thank you for asking. Uh, one of the story arcs of Robert Kennedy is he started out very tough, Joe McCarthy, anti the mob, goes through life and ends up opposing Lyndon Johnson, and you have a much more broadly thinking, empathetic person. How did that reflect with his parentage with you? Did you see a change in the way that he was at home as he went well, through Well, you this? know, he only lasted with Joe McCarthy for six months. You know that. Uh, yeah, I mean, he didn't really, I, I, uh, he didn't think he did the right thing. He didn't believe in him. And he wrote the indict, you know, he wrote the pa paper that um, uh, was censored Joe McCarthy. So that's, you know, he did that in the 50s. So it's not like, it took him a long time to realize Joe McCarthy was wrong. He was pretty quick about that this I was not his guy. Um, no, parenting was pretty um, strict, <laughs> to put it mildly. I mean, my mother, you know, was, came from a less strict background. Um, my mother, you know, would, uh, you know, the famous story about my mother is when we found some horses that were, starving, she took them home with us, and then she was sued um, by the owner for horse theory, which at that time was um, a hanging offense in Virginia, <laughs> and my father was the attorney general. So <laughs> I, I, I was always kind of used to, you know, on one hand, my, I had my mother, and the other hand, I had my father. And when my father was asked what, what mommy did, was, why she was stealing the horses, he said, I don't know what my wife does, you tell me. <laughs> So, so, but he had very high standards. Um, you know, when we played touch football, we had touch football practice on Saturday mornings. If you can touch the ball, you can catch it. It's they kind of hard uh, sometimes. <coughs> they, um, <laughs> they've got to get on the road. We have a few books left. Um, when I was uh, one day in Washington, I spoke at the monthly chapel of Sojourners, Jim Wallace's uh, organization. And uh, Kathleen and Sally Quinn came. And then we all went to lunch. And afterwards, Kathleen said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing in particular. She said, do you want to hang out with me? Well, I didn't need to be asked twice. So we go to her offices on Connecticut Avenue next to the Mayflower Hotel. And in her office, there is a picture of her horse jumping at a, um, at a what are they horse called, horse, horse show, right? <laughs> that, would, that would be clever. Um, <laughs> and of course, she had a helmet on. But she also had had an accident, and you broke something, right? Well, I've broken a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> This has nothing to do with I that know, question. But I, I have mean, a reason. I have a reason to do this. Oh yeah. Well, I f the 
I don't remember it because I was knocked out for three days. And, uh, and that's my head. Right. So if anything's wrong, I'm blaming yeah. <laughs> But my point is, in, in this picture, there are two letters uh, commiserating with what had happened to her. One, one was from the President of the United States and the other was from the Vice President. And the reason I mention it is because um, in my experience with her and members of the family, there really isn't any sense of privilege. There's a sense of duty. That is a profound difference. And I don't know any member of the family, children of Robert, and Ethel, cousins, grandchildren, that doesn't significantly engage in, in public service. And when I say that the Kennedys are the greatest American political family, um, you can entertain the Adams if you choose, are the Bushes, fair, but this is the family that more than any other has come to epitomize through our history, family and service uh, to the common wheel. So let's express our appreciation. Thank you.